Uh, so once again, how is my voice holding up for those at the back? Grand. Awesome. Um, so please introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about the film you work on. Let's start. Okay, uh, I'm Tom, the director, and this is Phil, uh, my co-producer and uh, cinematographer on Kin. Uh, and um, we went to film school together a lifetime ago. And um, yeah, after both sort of like going off and doing various other things that weren't film related, we both had a hankering to go back and put something together. And I've sort of tried to keep a hand in right little things here and there over the years, but ultimately whatever journey they went on, they always ended up in a drawer somewhere. And it's quite hard to write for an audience that's in a drawer. I thought, you know what, I want to I want to write something and put it out there. And what can we do, you know, within sort of set confined constraints where, you know, shoot something in a day, one location, two actors, but have it not feel like theatre and give you, hopefully, a full journey. Yeah, so that's actually our first the first one we've done in probably... 20 years. Yeah. You have done, I think, since film school, so... 20 years, yeah, so we charge back into it. Um, I will... Get to that shit, but it's interesting that you say that um, it's a full journey. I think my first question on the first note I've got written down is like, is it meant to be a prototype for a longer project? It hadn't been planned that way. I mean, I liked I liked the characters yeah. uh, and their energy, but no, I didn't I didn't have like okay. a, a hidden feature in the back of my head. But I, it, it was nice that yes, you kind of get a sense that you can imagine a world for them on either side of that scene. What did you have in mind? It just feels a little bit like there's more to this world with these characters of like, why are they doing this? Who do they work for? Who's mm-hmm. the woman? Whose story does it become beyond the violence? Mm-hmm. Like, is it a story of the person who has the debts and their kind of side characters in her story, or is it their story and they encounter various other people who are encountering other people who learn more about them? Yeah, I guess, I mean, I think the thing that I think would drew us to the idea was the idea of how mundane it is that these two people are sitting in the car talking and bickering about nonsense. And then actually they're, they're basically enforcers, aren't they? They go out and they hurt people, but they're actually very normal, almost boring. And, and it's kind of like, you know, and so the script sort of hides the ball and, until the end. Why are they there waiting? Yeah. Yeah. So the hope was that it would be interesting for their perspective. It's like their ability to put themselves in a very specific bubble. Their family and their, their, their co-worker exists inside that bubble and anybody outside of that they can very comfortably do violence to. It's about the ability to do other to anybody outside your circle. Hi, I am Joseph Burb. I directed Look Into My Eyes. Uh, that film was a project for university. I'm a first year student. Well, I was a first year student. It was a first year project. And it was a lot of work to get to that church. A lot of work to get that cinematography good. And, you know, a lot of work to get the actors. You know, it's paper parts on the same day. We had one day to film that church, just to paper both the same parts, present and past. Uh, but I I would loved it. I loved making that film. Dreading is amazing. We had a great crew. I love Rowan, my cinematographer, with the cinematography is beautiful. Like I can't trust you enough how like when we were editing we were looking at it, I'd go, oh my gosh, it's gorgeous. It's very pretty. It's a very pretty film. And uh, we had a we had great lenses, a great like a lens called hit off lens and great swirls, you know, in really like in the corner of the screens. Uh, uh, and yeah, and the sound design. Oh my god, the sound design was just like it's amazing. Joe Hutchings, oh, incredible. So dreamlike. So you know, like like you're actually like we living your memory in like a, like a wedding, and you're seeing your past child in the white dress, and with the bell was playing. It was beautiful sound. But like, and also writing the script with with Al and all that too. It's incredible. I love making that film. Yeah, I, about. You know, find yourself. You know, loving yourself again. It's just, just so simple, but it's so like lots of impact, lots to do. So yeah. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Paul Preston. Our film was Summer's Life. Um, just firstly, I want to say thanks very much to all the team involved at Kino for putting this on and supporting independent film. We appreciate you. Um, so I co-wrote and co-produced, and I also played adult Alan and older Alan. Um, it's a story of love that endures and lasts throughout the ages, um, not disposable uh, love. Um, and we originally made this film, it was a 60 second film challenge uh, that we did, um, but we filmed enough to then make it into a 
short beyond that challenge as well. Um, and the brief was a summer's love, summer, summer romance. Um, oh, but we filmed it on the beach in the middle of January. Uh, no, just, uh, <laughs> so it wasn't that warm um, but yeah that's a little bit about the, the story of the film we put together a whole new crew people we'd never met we just put notices out and grabbed people together filmed it in one day um, someone edited that together into one minute um, and then we built out a, a four minute short after that as well and Josh and I did the audio post for uh, Summer's Life. So, um, yeah, as you're saying, it was kind of this crew that was sort of assembled, um, you know, various different ways. I think it was through a Facebook group that I came on board for, for this one. But um, it was a really great crew to be a part of. I think uh, even though it was kind of through virtually, you know, talking to each other, um, it was just a really great atmosphere amongst the, the team. So, yeah, it was a pleasure to be a part of it, yeah. I'm Lewis and I wrote, produced and directed Where the Light Falls. Um, I'm just really interested in moments of self-awareness and turning points. Um, I feel like the vehicle for the main character was photography but also getting into a new friendship slash relationship with somebody else. Um, I feel like in my own life art and photography and acting and things like that have, have uh, really helped me to reflect on my own life and who I am. Uh, so really I wanted to explore that she's reflecting on the trauma in her life and realising what's going on around her and the vehicle for that is photography and also meeting someone new that just comes into her life and, and uh, reveals herself to herself if that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, that's what it's about. Hi, I'm Hannah, uh, I'm a writer and actor. Um, I wrote for both The Infinite, uh, which I came from loving Shakespeare and also being a queer woman growing up in a rural environment. Um, there can be a feeling of invisibility, um, so I wanted to look at that. Um, I love the idea of kind of souls that can't be together in the past, kind of coming together in the future. Um, and I've loved the work of Jack and Gwyn. For years and years and years we grew up in the same small rural town, um, went through similar experiences to an extent. and. So we uh, originally made the film for a uh, Shakespeare Shorts kind of film challenge with Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. And uh, yeah, just uh, Jack brought it to life with loads of magic. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah uh, I'm Jack Berry. I directed and was the cinematographer for The Both Are Infinite. Um, me and Hannah had kind of, because we've we known each other a long time, um, and there was always this sense of like, who else is in Cumbria that's like creative and maybe we could work together at some point and um, it just kind of ended up being you know there are a few different ideas that maybe we could do together but then um, I ended up coming across the festival which was the Shakespeare Shorts festival that we're looking for three minute basically the only brief was like three minute adaptations of Shakespeare and I think that that was really cool because we could kind of just interpret that in our own our own way um, and I know that there was a discussion that was like, well, do we do something a bit more traditional that does feel like a period drama, or do we do something that's a bit more updated? And I think we, got, we, struck, we, we sort of decided to kind of do both and sort of overlap them by having two different timelines and two different styles. Um, but yeah, um, it, was, it, was, it, was very, it was very fun to make. <laughs> we also wanted something that had a happy ending, because mm. a lot of queer stories end in death, as um, Romeo and Juliet obviously also end in death. So it's quite <coughs> important to kind of have a bit of a hopeful mm. thing going on in the modern version of it. Yeah. Um, so Hannah, um, obviously you adapted Romeo and Juliet in the three minutes because that's what you had to do. But there's so many quotable lines in Romeo and Juliet, so many lines that so many people know, and also so many interesting side characters. How difficult was it to choose what lines to cut and what ones to keep? But also how easy was it to let go of, I don't know, the friar or Mercutio? Oh, um... <laughs> <coughs> Good question. <laughs> um, I think, you know, because it was only three minutes, it, it, it really was like, let's get to the heart of like what the story is and what the story we want to tell is. And at the heart, it's a, it's a love story between two people who have um, kind of what feels like the rest of the world against them. So I think that's why we honed in on Romeo and Juliet specifically. Um, 
and I guess that the other characters in the rest of the world almost became um, to an extent that I guess when I was writing the kind of more modern scenes I was imagining the challenges that you do face in environments where you can't be yourself and you can't kind of be open um, and so all of the kind of other characters boiled down to that but it's one of those where if we had a lot more time with it, it we wouldn't have cut so many characters obviously it's almost it's, 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 sort of, it's more isolating to just have these two characters that kind of only have each other and it's almost like mm -hmm. it's a weird kind of dreamy thing that there's no kind of supporting characters there's, there's not even any extras or anything and that's mostly a budget thing um, <laughs> they're at a party and it's just them yeah, there's no one else at this party, but um, I, I think that, um, I don't know, I like that there's, there's something dreamy that's like, they only see each other, they go, yeah. there's nothing really else going on in the world that they live in. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, for both Lewis and Jack, um, and I'm sorry if this is slightly presumptuous, mm -hmm. the art of direction, like any other art form, is deciding what to show and what not to show at the same time. What do you feel that your perspective brought to female queer stories? <coughs> I feel like for me, the character of Vanessa serves showing Leah a new way of being. And one part that was really vital is that when she asks her to go out and they go to a club, it's like she's showing her her own town, even though, even though Vanessa's come over from Spain, she's showing her this new world and she's showing her it's like when she's when she's in that nightclub, she feels very alien, um, and I feel like it's just the perspective of showing someone what's kind of in front of them and what's there and what they already are. And I feel like for me, it's kind of like going through life building on my own self awareness. That's what I brought to it in the sense that it's about this character developing an awareness of what's already there. If that makes sense. I, I suppose, for me, like, there, I guess there maybe was a bit of in the back of my mind, is it okay that I'm kind of making like a queer story? Um, and, but I, I think that a, a lot of the, the kind of romance and tenderness and little moments, like the kind of the near kisses and the hand holding and a, a lot of that intimacy, I almost didn't really see it as anything other than just love and, and romance. And, and I guess, because I know what that feels like, I kind of just almost kind of worked in my own experiences of what that, that feels like uh, and, and hopefully that, that translates on screen. I think there's a little bit of a theme in, in the drama, most of the films have seen the second half about intimacy. How difficult was Summer's Life being such a personal intimate story to tell through the coll collective art form of filmmaking? Mm. Um, it, well it was an incredible experience. Um, it was one of those things that because it was the team and the project was thrown together at such short notice, I think you almost didn't have the opportunity to think about whether it was difficult or not. And the magic just happened. Um, so I co-wrote with uh, Fallon, who directed. Um, we, it was just such a tight timeline when these challenges come up and you get the brief and, you know, a week later you submit the final thing. I think we just didn't have time to think about whether it was difficult or not. We just always like, right, get casting, get crew, where are we going to do it? Um, uh, it's mum, I play alongside my mum, uh, uh, so she is my real mum in real life. And I just said, oh mum, uh, we're going to do a bit of filming, can we uh, film at yours? She said, yeah, that's fine. I said, do you want a little part? She said, yeah, that's fine. And I, we turned up with about 20 people and she went, oh, there's quite a few of you. I'll, I'll get some more mugs out, you know. Um, but she really sort of stole the show. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, I think, really it's thanks to Fallon's writing direction and, and also everything that went into it beyond the acting. So, you know, the, the, the edit, the sound that really pulled the story together and drew you in. And I think every time I watch it, I take something different from it, but especially, and, and just did such an amazing job, like the, the clock ticking. Because even if it, even for you, if it wasn't necessarily about love for you, it, it, you've got a reflection on my life's ticking, and you might you might not have had that that lifelong romance, but there's still elements of 
relatability about you reflect on where you are, your past, and, and how time ticks away for all of us. Um, but I think to answer the question, I, I think we, we probably just honestly did not have time to think about what's difficult. It's just, let's go. <laughs> Third grade. Third grade. Well, Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, so, when light falls, similar question. Did I spy five writers on that? Sorry, sorry, not sorry. I've got my nose mixed up. Um, I looked into my eyes. Did I spy five writers on that? Sorry. 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 When you say something, sorry. What? Did I see that there was five writers on that in the credits? Uh, yeah, it's five writers. Yeah, it's five of us. It's five writers. Uh, so again, it's a uni project, and we all have to collaborate together. Uh, so it was me, Joseph, and Al Jones, uh, Mason Berry, Joe Hutchings, and Bill Wilson. So all like you know, like, most of them all did what we write together. Uh, but it was mainly me and Al who really was attached towards the dialogue. And uh, the great detail about the dialogue that we thought about a lot was, at first, it's very poetic how the present version of herself talks and how like and then later on in the film she gets more and more simple with the dialogue because it's actually she just really wants she starts to like you know feel her past merging together and or well, you know the past she should have and the love she she has for herself and I we really wanted that detail in the script for dialogue because I love your Olivia too which Elle wrote uh, I, I actually almost didn't put it at first with the, the, the like the, the table read I was like, yeah, but I don't think we should put Love You Too. And all the lecturers looked at me like, you should put I Love You Too in the script, keep it in. I'm like, okay, we'll keep it in the script. So we always did have that I Love You Too back, too. We're supposed to be just end like that, just disappear. But I Love You, I Love You Too is so simple. It's so beautiful. I think we all need to do that. I think we all need to tell us that's how I love myself. We need to. Um, even like, I feel like, like even when I, because obviously in the end of the door opens still, it, it's not closed, it's still open. I feel like after she said I love you, I think she's going to go back there and say it again because at time to time we always have like, we love ourselves and then the next day after that we're like, the next day, oh shit, I hate myself. I hate myself so much. And then the, later on, a few hours later, we love ourselves again. I think it happens all the time with me. I'm always like, do I like myself? Do I not like myself? I think we all relate to that. So I think that's what the point for the last two lines. I'm so glad we kept it. Thank you, Elle. Who, uh, she's not, they're not here today, but like, that, those two lines are just perfect. It was amazing, yeah. Um, speaking of good dialogue, um, Kin feels entirely, that feels incredibly tightly rehearsed. How much of those performances come from just sitting down and doing it again and again and again? And how much comes from just having very talented actors? We try not to do too much, because um, then you Obviously, you lose some of that freshness and have them feel sort of relaxed with it. But I did want to do a day before with the actors, so we had them by like um, 48 hours before the shoot. We just sat down and we just had them play off each other and just try to get a sense of where their heads were at. So we didn't try and drill them over and over again. I think we just did like three read throughs where I just tried to pivot where their heads were at in terms of how they were approaching certain sections. But wanted to try and stay as hands off as possible because. You, know, you don't know how many times on the day you might find yourself doing it. So you just wanted to make sure everybody was on the right track, but they weren't maybe, you know, you want them to nail it for, you know, your second or third take. You don't want them to nail it the day before. You know, there's another aspect to it, which was we were just very aware that to make it visually interesting, we had these two people just sat in a car talking. You think, well, it's going to be like six, six and a half minutes, something like that. You think, well, how are we going to kind of bring the changes visually and sort of... Sorry, are you just reading my notes? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> you ask a question, sorry. It's cool. yeah. just funny, like, everything you come out is like, I've, I've got that. <laughs> so well, well, what, I go, what was their edge? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, what was your, what were you, what was there something you were going to... So, it's, I was just, like, if we had the time, I was going to ask about, um, as a kind of a cheap dialogue-focused film, like, how much emphasis was there to move the camera to get that kind of visual energy rather than like, you know what, we're doing it cheaply, we're doing it quickly, there you go. We storyboarded it, you see it quite a bit. Well, right? yeah. yeah, yeah, we, we did we did think very hard about what we were going to, we studied, <laughs> we spent an evening studying people in films talking in cars, okay. uh, just to sort of see how they did it and where they put the camera and why. And Annoyingly, a lot of them have a very expensive piece of glass in the front of the car <coughs> that you can actually shoot through and get yeah. your two shot. 
We didn't have that car. Yeah, we learned oh, that, I yeah. guess. So we were like, okay, we shot with the door open or we shot through the window or something like that. But we were trying to keep, we were trying to change the proportions of the characters and introduce them in interesting ways and, you know, just, uh, you know, just try and uh, keep it moving. But we didn't want to, you know, change the shot without it meaning something or, you know, yes, you're part of the flow. But, like, there's a moment when it does clearly shift and you get a, a, a much more, like, a severe angle and it was it's marked a shift point. Yeah, the woman's scary at first, and then towards the end you're like, actually, the man's kind of terrifying in his own way, maybe more so. And then they kind of get parity at the end. We switched that shot in the back seat just to kind of give them parity. And so we were kind of, we kind of, so, you know, we visually couldn't think, well, they're actually kind of similar. Yeah, and then you find out what they're really there for. So we wanted to, we wanted it to feel visually different when we kind of cut to the reveal, if you can call it that. But, uh, yeah, it was fun. How are we doing for time? Um, yeah, a yeah, couple of questions from the audience now, I think. Yeah. Open the floor. <laughs> what? what um, Lewis. Lewis, sorry. Yeah. Uh, with, uh, with the camcorder footage um, that you used, was that footage that you had? Um, or, yeah, where did it come from and how did you, like... I found it on YouTube. YouTube? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, so it, was, um, it belonged to a lady. She lived in the, uh, the southern states of the US. And uh, so I found her on Facebook. Her YouTube name and her Facebook name was the same. I was just like, can I use it? And she was like, yeah. So it's basically yeah. Her daughter's like 40 now or something like that. So yeah, it was, it was a really good find. Amazing. Would you have used it if she said no? No, no, I don't think so. No. <laughs> I'll try, I'll just keep going until someone says yes. <laughs> Start to pester them. Uh, Rich, you had a question? I was going to say, what, you know, what's, what's next? Okay. What, uh, what are people doing next? Jump. Sure. Start the front. Yeah, um, well, funny enough, me, me and Hannah actually have collaborated again on a horror project um, that we made. Uh, three or four months after we finished this. Mm -hmm. um, and that has been completed and uh, it's been screened at <coughs> uh, an event. Uh, but it's not public yet, but we're going to release it on the 1st of October. That's a folk horror project. Um, yeah, very English folk horror period. Um, totally the exact opposite of Oh yeah, very thing. different. Yeah, yeah, very, very cursed and scary. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm writing a few other little bits that um, hopefully Jack, Gwyn and I will collaborate on in the future. We'll see. Uh, I've written a script about when I was 10 and my brother went to prison. Uh, yeah, it's not a comedy. Um, <laughs> I'm, just, uh, I'm just looking for money for it at the minute. Uh, I'm do working on the audio post for a few of the short films. Um, I think there's one kind of a commentary on... Um, the Palestine uh, conflict now, and um, <coughs> and then with Fallon as well, same same kind of crew that we did Summer's Life with. There's a few um, different things on the go at the moment, so yeah, exciting that stuff. Yeah, so I just um, wrapped on a feature film yesterday uh, called Cartel Hitman, which goes into post-production um, due for streaming release, probably in about 12 months' time. Uh, Fallon and I are about to go into principal photography on our next short film, Angels and Demons. So we're hoping to film that in October, October, November. Um, and we've got about a half a dozen projects in the pipeline for next year's shorts. And um, we're working on a feature film script at the moment as well. Yeah, me, I'm right. I'm current, well, I'm writing with a third year student uh, with their final film for the year, uh, for their uh, degree. And it's about death, and it's about how we deal with guilt differently. Uh, many of us like have like different thoughts of how to process death. I think that's what it's about. About dreams, also very interesting, very surreal, very dystopian. I'm really interested in about death recently because I think that's where we're going to go for our next. Uh, I know, but like it's like it's a ways <laughs> off. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's ways, ways off for yourself. Yeah, no, yeah, but yeah. now it's about death, and like, yeah, how, I know, like, though. <laughs> But like, that's what we're interested in next, and we've got ideas for that concept too, so it's going to be exciting. Um, well, I've got a script I'm quite fond of that I'd like to get made, you know, where I expand things out a bit. It's for three locations and 
five actors, so I've been from, from this, but I've not begun like doing the road of uh, trying to get funding because I'd like to actually be able to throw money at this one rather than just pooling resources. Um, but we should know this week if um, via a, a, a local Manchester band if we've got funding through them for a, one, a music video for uh, their latest release, which is heavily inspired by Twilight Zone. Uh, their name's Ivan Campo. Oh, yeah. Lovely guys. I've said I work with Tom as long as it's two people talking in a car. So <laughs> one <laughs> two people talking, that's it. So it'll be a very Twilight Zone one location car, two people. Literally, yeah. I work with you. <laughs> yeah. And what's next with Kino John? Uh, we've got the next event on. Well, actually, we've got an event on Saturday in Tenby, which is a Tenby Arts Festival, which is like a, we're showing some of the award-winning films from this year's festival, and we're we're showing that program, I think, also in Rottenstall next month, and then in a small gig over in Cholton. Uh, the next Kino Shorts is on the last. When, next Wednesday, or next, sorry, Tuesday, the last Tuesday of next month. Okay, post those. Yeah. yeah. Keep following us on social media uh, yeah. for the exact uh, date. Of this will be the location. Awesome. Uh, one more time for the filmmakers, please. Could the filmmakers from the first half come to the front as well?